to start the second session. And I think uh, the speaker, George Foxy, doesn't really need any introduction. Uh, uh, the, he's one of the founding fathers of the phylogenetic analysis. I think he's looked at more ribosomes than about anybody except Carl Rose. And uh, so he'll be talking to us about dynamics and the evolution of history of the ribosome. I would interject that I, I think Harry Knoller has looked at a lot more ribosomes than I have. Uh, so I want to talk today about the ribosome and where it came from and what happened to it after it got started. And there's a reason for this, and it's by this slide here, which comes from the now infamous letter from Carl to Francis Crick in 1969. And in this letter, Carl explains several things about the phylogeny and such, but in here he said, what more ancient lineages are there? A priori it seems impossible to evolve any structural gene without the capacity to translate the gene making, the evolution of some rudimentary translation machine necessarily a very early happening. Hopefully that machine was the direct linear ancestor of the present one. Okay, and also I feel that the RNA components of that machine hold more promise than most of the protein components, and that has ultimately been our experience. So basically, the reason we work on ribosomes is because Carl told us we should work on ribosomes, okay? So that's, now, now there's, it turns out that, and we've come to realize that there's probably two distinct aspects of this study of ribosomes. Mainly, one is where did this chemistry come from, and the other ha is, where, what happened to the ribosome once it got started, so the subsequent evolution of the ribosome. And I'm going to talk about both, and I'm not going to solve either one. Okay. And so the question is then, what does the poly, when does the polypeptide synthesis actually, what does polypeptide synthesis actually require? And it turns out that there's two aspects to it, and this seems to be overlooked a lot by the, the origin of life people. Not that they really don't know it, it's just they don't think about it very often. <laughs> There's one is you have to be able to synthesize the peptide bond, okay? But that doesn't solve the problem. You also have to do it over and over again in order to make something useful in size, okay? So you have two aspects to it, and they're rather different. And we're going to hypothesize that it's actually the entrance to the exit tunnel has something to do with the second step, which is the critical one. Okay, and so this shows where the exit tunnel is, all right, and, and the exit tunnel here is shown in, in the red uh, basis, so this is the 23S, portion of the 23S secondary structure, and uh, this is showing, a, this is a picture from Robin Gotell, and he drew the secondary structure, this is only part of it, but he drew the secondary structure of the 23S RNA, I think when he was working with Harry, and, and the, uh, nicely made this PTC as part of, you know, he didn't know about this, but this circular area here in the middle is actually the peptidyl transferase center in this general area here. It's also the entrance to the exit tunnel. And so this is what it looks like when, when in, in a, you know, the 3D type of image from crystallographic structures. And what we have here in the middle is basically a hole, which is actually a pore, and these bases in purple surround that pore, okay? And this is also the whole PTC region. And when you actually have the peptide synthesis, what happens is this hole is occupied by the A site and P site tRNAs go in there to create something that looks like this. Okay, so the two tRNAs enter into that hole and you get proximity between the amino acids, which are at the end of the tRNA, right, at the CCA and the tRNA, and you're getting, you're getting proximity there. And when you look at this, if you put the whole tRNA on there, it would be huge and would basically fall off. So it has to be a small RNA that goes in there. It has to be charged with an amino acid. And, and we, there's some ideas in the literature on how to do that, okay? I'm not going to talk about that. 
And so our exit tunnel hypothesis is basically the following, that the way this gets started is you have the two small RNAs carrying amino acids go into that hole in the PTC region, okay? And they're there at the same time, and what's going to happen is because you now have proximity, you're gonna make a peptide bond, and so now one of the small RNAs is carrying two amino acids, a dipeptide, the other one's carrying nothing. And now this is the critical moment in evolution because what has to happen is the one with two has to stay around to do it again and the one with zero has to go away so a new one can come in with a single amino acid so that you could now make three. Right? And so our basic hypothesis is what the exit tunnel does is, is it allows that one that has two, that one, there are many ways you can envision this happening, but basically it traps it in some way so that the one with two has a higher probability of staying than the one with none. Okay? And so that allows a new one to come with a single base and now you can extend to three. So that's the basic idea of our exit tunnel hypothesis. And so that the exit tunnel is there, the, the pore that goes ultimately becomes the exit tunnel, allows the one to stay preferentially to the other, and that would allow then the polymerization. And we've written a paper on that, and no one reads it, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so, the, so if this is true, if the RNA world could readily produce RNAs with PTC-like pores, that would be really important because that would mean that peptide synthesis could get started very early. Incidentally, I, if I believe in an RNA world at all, I believe in an abbreviated RNA world because I think the first thing that an RNA world would invent would be peptide synthesis, and as soon as you invent peptide synthesis, you don't have an RNA world anymore. But that's that's, that's another story for another time. And so we raised the question of how common are PTC-like pores. So we have this pore we think is important. Does our, do RNAs readily make this kind of pore? And the answer is to be observed. So what we did was we started looking for pores of this type or of this general size, and it turns out they're roughly nanometer pores, actually one nanometer by one nanometer approximately. That's what they are. So we started looking through the RNA structures and looking to see if we could find any more holes or pores of this type. And we looked at the ribosomal RNAs, and we actually looked at other RNAs, and we found a bunch of pores, and this slide lists the pores we found in, in the ribosomal RNAs. And this picture shows where some of these pores are in the 23S RNA, the large subunit RNA. And this, this here is the PTC pore in this area right here. And this is a pore which is very interesting. This is the L1 protein which is actually involved in the E site and the expulsion of, of the spent tRNA. Uh, so there's multiple pores. And you look at them up close, and all the pores look like this, okay? And, oops, sorry. Oh, I'm lost. Okay, well, where are we? Go back this way. All right, so the, pour, the pores look like this. So you have, you have this hole, and here we have the bases are colored in green, and the backbone atoms are this brown or orange color, okay? And what you see is the pore is completely, almost completely lined with these bases. With, I'm sorry, with, with the backbone atoms. It's the backbone atoms that are lining the pore. However, in the one case of the ribosomal pore, it looks like this. Okay, so this is, this is the actual PTC pore, and here we see the bases on the interior facing into the pore, so that they're actually able then to contact with parts of the RNA, like the CCA stem uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the tRNA, okay? So the, it turns out that although pores of the right size are very common, the type of pore that's involved at, at the PTC is quite different in, in the way it's organized. And so, this made me very unhappy because we we're hoping that this whole idea of being able to make the PTC pore would be, would be very easy. You could readily do that from an RNA world, but it doesn't appear that you can. I'm not, I certainly haven't given up, but uh, uh, not, it's not clear what's happening there. So that was uh, you know, kind of a loose end at this point. Now the other problem is the 
issue of what happens after you get a primitive translation machinery. So once you have a primitive translation machinery, how do you go from there to the modern ribosome? So, so that's ribosome history, which is sort of, it's sort of a separate issue, but it, you know, is in many ways more accessible. You, it's easier to say things about it without doing experiments necessarily, just by comparing structures in various interesting ways. And you have to, should realize that there's multiple functional centers in the ribosome, and so we, we have at least five functional centers. It's a complex machine. It's a very dynamic machine. It's a very complex machine. And it's obviously been built up over time. And you have the PTC, which in our view is the is got to be the beginning uh, and the oldest part of the ribosome. But then you also have the exit tunnel, which is basically of equal age with the PTC. Uh, and you have bridges that compare. So you actually have two subunits, a 50S subunit and a 30S subunit in bacteria and archaea. And you they come together and they're held together at various times by bridging elements. And then there's the decoding center, which is actually in the 30S subunit, where you, you decode thing, and the GTPA center, which is, uh, which is facilitating the motion. So the question becomes which part of the large ribosome RNAs are actually the oldest parts of the RNA, and this goes back to Carl's statement at the beginning that the RNA was going to be more interesting than the protein. And so we, we set out to figure out if we could guess which parts of the RNA were the oldest, because here you got this RNA, the 23S RNA is 2,900 residues. Uh, you know, it can't be all primitive. There must be parts of that RNA which are newer than other parts. And we did various things. One of the things we initially looked at was connectivity. We had a graduate student hypothesis. A uh, graduate student comes from a foreign country, perhaps China, and, and doesn't know anybody. And then after a while, he learns, he meets his lab mates, he meets his grocery store guy, and he starts to know people. And then after a while, he moves on to another lab in another city, and he meets more people. So over time, your connectivity increases. So what we did was we looked at the ribosomal RNA in terms of the tertiary structures, and we looked for connectivity, and we counted the connectivity, and we came up with an idea of what we thought were the oldest areas. And then there was other models that were used. Uh, there was an onion model, which uh, Lauren Williams's group at Georgian Tech introduced. They took the whole ribosome and said, well, let's, let's cut stuff off like an onion. The stuff that's in the interior is old. The stuff that's on the exterior is new, and, and that kind of thing. And then one of the best models was the A minor interaction model that was introduced by Bokoff and Steinberg. And they basically came to the conclusion that A minor interactions might be timing events. And so an A minor interaction occurs when you have a helix and then a stretch of A's intercalate into the minor groove of the helix. And so it's a timing event because the A minors can't intercalate unless there's a helix. Okay, and so the idea is that one of them has to, so that the helix has to come before the A's. And so he looked at this and he looked at all the A minor interactions and this chart sort of shows the, this is the, you have a, you have a red circle that represents a helical element that's involved in an A minor interaction, and then you have a yellow circle, which is the A's that go interact. And it's kind of hard from up here for me to see, but each set of yellows will interact ultimately to the red. And when you do this, the helices that are involved in the A minor interactions, there's a whole lot of them here in the PTC, which we think is the oldest part, right? And then there's a whole bunch over here, and this particular helix is the early phase of the exit tunnel, and then there's some more scattered around, okay? And so he developed a model, or they developed a model for, for the actual relative age of all the individual helices. And so this is sort of a summary of the various approaches, and what you see are uh, the air, this is kind of an ugly picture, but, uh, that Lauren made for me one day. And this is uh, the PTC region here, which everybody agrees is old. This here here is the extension of the exit tunnel from the PTC. Where did my picture go? I don't know. It, it, right here. And this here is actually the part uh, that's bridging over to the 30S subunit. So those appear to be the oldest parts of the RNA. And up here at the top, not included, is actually the GTPA center, which appears to be a relatively late addition. Okay, so then along came a new idea 
by Anton Petrov in, in Williams's lab, who put together the idea of insertion events, accretion events, along with the A minor interactions and came up with a new model. And, and I like this slide. This was done in 1981 by Ken Lurson, who was one of Carl's graduate students, actually, and then came and worked for me for a couple of years. Um, and he discovered, we discovered this RNA, 5S RNA, that has an insertion of 108 nucleotides, okay? And this was actually the first insertion element ever discovered in a ribosomal RNA because at the time we didn't have a secondary structure yet for 16S and 23S or well understood structure from multiple organisms so you couldn't have found insertion events so this must have been the first one and so and so any event this was an insertion event but what's interesting about this is you got an insertion here of 108 nucleotides okay now this only occurs in halococcus every halococcus strain that we ever sequence has the insertion but if you go to Halobacterium or any other organism, it doesn't exist, okay? So this insertion occurred recently. So this is a recent insertion in relative to the phylogenetic tree. But what's interesting about it is if you delete the insertion, you have no effect on the structure. You see, you have this little helix here, and you have the UA base pair and the GC base pair. I eliminate that, and this will just be base paired, and it'll be perfectly happy, normal 5S secondary structure. So what's happening is the accretion, the addition of the insertion, is not changing the core structure. So what Anton was able to do was he was able to take the secondary structure models of 23S and 16S and look for events of, that might be of this sort and then, and then actually see in the universal parts of the structure actually find things that appear to be added. And so that's a little esoteric. But basically, he ultimately, this allowed him to and in conjunction with the A minor results to come up with a model of the relative age of all the helical elements in the, in the 23S. And so starting here in the dark blue and the light blue is the PTC, then comes the green, which is actually then, this is the exit tunnel, and then, then the yellow, which is going here over to the 30S particle, et cetera, and then the various tips are in red. And so he, he proposes that there's actually, he classifies these into phases because he can't really tell if this one is older than this one here. Then I say this one here and this one here. He can't really tell because they're separate and things. That's actually the encouragement of the five of us. But in any event, he, so he breaks it down into various phases. And then in some unpublished work, he's now done the same thing with the 30S subunit. And now what we find out is that we have an interesting aspect that we have phases over here in the 23S RNA, we have phases over here in the 16S, and they bridge together, and you have to f somehow coordinate the phase definition between the two particles because the 30 50s particle is presumably older than the 30s and and you're and you're linking them together and you link them together when when you have a bridging element from the 50s right you know the relative age of that relative to other parts of the 50s okay and then you so that is a starting point for the 30s because it can't be older than the thing that bridges it to the 50S particle or something, unless it evolved independently. There's a lot of debate about where the 30S subunit came from, the 16S RNA. Some people actually think it was the original, originally involved in, in, in transcribing the, you know, replicating the RNA genome in the RNA world, so that there's some interesting discussion about that, but we won't go into that, and it's maybe in the discussion. Now, this ribosome, okay, so this is a mandatory slide. I cannot come to the University of Illinois and give a talk where Carl Woese's name is mentioned and not show this slide. Okay, this is Carl's ratchet model for the way in which protein synthesis work. He published this in 1970. He basically proposed that the essence of translation, that it was a dynamic machine, it was driven by a dynamic tRNA that alternated between two configurations, okay, and which he called the shine, uh, two, two configurations, which were the Fuller-Hodgkin's configurations. And this paper was very interesting, published in 1970. Fuller-Hodgkin's published a paper in 1967 pointing out that there were two possible confirmations of uh, the uh, 
tRNA, anticodon loop. Carl was giving a talk in his class, and he needed a paper to discuss, and so somebody said, discuss the Fuller-Hodgson paper, so he discussed the Fuller-Hodgson paper in class, and while he was doing it, he came up with this model for translation, okay, this, this model. And this is this reciprocating ratchet model. And, uh, and it was proposed in 1970, and he recognized the fact that the tRNA was dynamic. And that leads us to the modern world where it's actually been discovered that as you go through the process of translation, the tRNA actually moves in conformation. There's a whole series of conformations, and there's actually a hinge in the tRNA right around here. There's a center of motion right around here, which is not strictly in the anticodon loop. So I submit to you that Carl did not have the details right, but he had the idea spot on. Okay, he, he understood what this was required. So the tRNA has this hinge, and the tRNA, as we go through the different aspects of translation, as the tRNAs move through the ribosome, you would form different conformations of the tRNA. So the modern ribosome is an inherently dynamic machine, and the motions are facilitated by two proteins, EFTU and EFG. And what we did recently is we actually tried to compare some of these structures. Because I got interested, we were doing some journal club and talking about the tRNA and, and all that, and this hinge point, and I kept saying, where is this hinge point? Where is it? And you know, finally we found some papers that told us where it was, but we were looking at it. And then I start reading some of the papers on crystal structures, various ribosomes, and people are constantly talking about, well, when we have the EFG cleave, as cleavage occurs, such and such happens, and this that used to be here is now over here, this is near that, this is near that, but they never talked about where the motion was actually originating from. At least I couldn't find it very often, and there were a couple papers that mentioned that. Harry did that. Harry Nowler, in one of his recent papers, has actually identified a couple hinges I'll show you in a bit. Uh, and so we decided, well, let's look for these hinges. And so we developed a, a kind of a, a makeshift algorithm for look, comparing the structures and looking for the things that were associated with the movement. And so we tried to find all the hinges we could find in, in the ribosomal RNAs. And this is, this is a summary uh, of the 23S RNA, what we now call pivot points. And there's a whole lot of them, and what's interesting about them is they're always associated with weak points in the structures, a GU base pair or, or some other kind of non-standard base pair, bulges. And so if you look, at, so if you take another RNA and you look at it, you'll, you'll, and you see the secondary structure and you'll see these bulges and stuff, I guarantee you those are points of motion that, that RNA, for that RNA, they're points of flexibility. Anyway, uh, so we found the pivot points are usually associated with these various weak points, and this is a quick plot of where they're located. And, and so the ones that are in red are the ones we found, and the, there's two here in blue. There's one here, these are blue that Harry proposed, and this one here, because of the nature of our algorithm, we could not test this if, with our algorithm at all. And this one here, we got the pivot point here, he's got the pivot point here, but in, either, in any event, it's in that helix, which is helix 28. Uh, so essentially, the, that's been done. Now, subsequently, we've done this for the 30th subunit, and we have a paper that we just submitted the revision. Hopefully, it'll get published sometime in the coming year. Uh, but the two pivots in particular, helices 28 and 32, appear to occur, actually control other pivots, other two motions. So there's a whole bunch of pivots that are controlled specifically by 28 and 32, and they are associated with the major motions of the ribosome, the head swivel and the inner subunit rotation. And so this is sort of a... Uh, a network diagram of what we found in the 50S particle, and you can see 20, 28 here uh, is controlling all these pivots, and 32 is controlling all these pivots here, and also there seems to be connectivity that takes you back to the tRNA, and we've been working on a model for, for the, some kind of network model. Uh, 
so in any event, we recently went back to Petrov's model of the ribosome where he has a relative age for all the helices. And so we said, where are these mobile helices, these, these pivot points, where are they relative to the phases in evolution of the ribosome? Are they at the early phases or are they late phases? So we look back and basically in the LSU, all of these pivot points are located either in phase five or phase six helices. And phase six are the most recent, phase five are the not quite so recent. In the SSU, again, the vast majority of them are in phase five or six, okay? And so what this is basically telling us is that the dynamics of the ribosome has primarily been added relatively recently in ribosome history, okay? But not all of it, because the tRNA was there already, okay, it's dynamic, and it turns out that there's some other helices which are actually dynamic. Helix 89, which is right in the PTC, and helix 44 and 28, are in the 16S, they're phase one and phase two, whereas all the others are phase four, three, four, four, five, or six. And these two helices are located right here. Okay? And that's, we now think that that, and I don't think many people would disagree, but that's the dynamic part of the ribosome in terms of moving the messenger RNA. You have to move the messenger RNA. This is the core motion. This is the original motion, multile part of the 30S subunit right here. And, and that's what we think, as the analysis is telling us. So, our fully dynamic ribosome, once you add everything, once you start getting this ribosome which is dynamic, which can make peptide bonds and make small proteins, our view is that that's the end of the RNA world. The RNA world is doomed by the ribosome. As soon as the ribosome can make interesting proteins, the RNA world is over. And it raises a question of frustration for me because I can't, haven't got the capabilities to do the experiments, but the experiment that should be done that nobody does is what is the smallest polypeptide that can replicate an RNA? Now, I'm pretty sure that peptides can replicate RNA because we have these things called enzymes that replicate RNA, and, uh, and so we know they can do it. So what's the, what's the simplest peptide that can actually replicate an RNA? What does the primitive ribosome have to do in order to eliminate the RNA world, as if the RNA world ever even existed? That's, but that's another issue. And so our summary, some, because I didn't solve either problem, I apologize. Uh, but we have the core dynamic elements actually exist in the ribosome at early stages. And presumably the fully dynamic ribosome came later when you start adding the EFG and the EFTU to the process. But all that happened before LUCA because we still haven't got a mature ribosome when that occurs. We still have other helices and things to add. And finally, the RNA world would, will cease to exist by the time of LUCA, probably somewhat before, if it happens. And so then our various co-workers, uh, we've collaborated with uh, various people, particularly at Georgia Tech, where we had, for a while, we had an astrobiology center at Georgia Tech that I was part of. And then we're funded currently by the Exo NASA Exobiology Program. Okay, and so that's the end of my story for now. This is the ribosome with real tRNA. It's not all they do on time. Two minutes left. Too much left. No, two minutes. To go. Yeah, uh, and then there'll be five minutes for questions. So that's really bad, because I'm going to have to deal with seven minutes of questions. These other guys only had to deal with five. There ought to be a reward. <laughs> Okay, and anybody got a question I might be able to answer? Sure, go ahead. Uh, so when you were looking at uh, the PTC core and looking at other structures and other ribosomes on the long term, aren't you asking the wrong question? Shouldn't you be asking how often can you get that core with, the, uh, with things pointed in, in for random RNA rather than, than existing? Because we must have evolved now to not have other cores just randomly. Well, well, okay, I, I mean, I'll address part of that question, I think. It's reasonable to assume that one thing you would not, not want to do if you were evolving a ribosome is have two PTs at the same time, two PTCs at the same time, So I think is what you're alluding to. So we would expect that the other, other pores might be in some way different. But 
we looked at other RNAs, and their pores are also have this unfortunate effect, okay? That, that they don't have the RNA interacting into the pore, but they have the, just the backbone atoms defining the pore. So, yeah. Now, the other part of the question was the variable, you want me to vary the thing. And so presumably over evolutionary time it's been optimized, and of course that's one of the problems. So what we would like to do in the lab, and theoretically we're trying to do this, and Lauren Williams is trying to do this, and other people have already tried to do this and failed, is to create a RNA in the lab that can actually catalyze peptide synthesis without any of the ribosomal proteins, okay? A really simplified model. And if you could create a really simplified model, say 200 residues that could do peptide synthesis at some level, then you could ask the question, you know, if can I make it worse or can I make it better? What do I have to do? You know, what's the simplest thing will actually work, et cetera, et cetera. But we need an experimental model and we don't currently have one. So I'm going to ignore whatever the rest of your question was. <laughs> Uh, no, but I'm sure the pivot points are not where those sequences are. Uh, I wonder if I have that slide. I don't have that slide with me. Uh, we, I have a map of where those, where those key things are. Well, let me comment about something, because you talked about the signature sequences, and maybe I shouldn't bring this up. But Carl and I never really believed in trees, okay? Tree is a mathematical model. And it only looks like a tree when you get far away from it in time. So when you're, when you're at the actual node where it's happening, it's population biology. And you don't really know what's going to happen, okay? And so one of the things that always bothered Carl was when I, I had written these programs that would make trees using tr primitive clustering techniques. He was always suspicious that he didn't like that tree. He wanted to see, he said, well, I know from looking at the sequences, and he had them all memorized, certain sequences were shared by certain groups, and he knew that certain, you know, these sequences were universal, and these were showing up in all the bacillus, but nowhere else and stuff. So he had the idea that there were signature sequences, and I would keep trying to explain to him, but Carl, that's what the, that's what the clustering algorithm is doing. It's finding those signature sequences and using them to make trees. But he would say, no, 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 no. And so it got to the point where he thought that I didn't believe in his signatures. He was very unhappy with me because I didn't like his signatures. I was perfectly happy with his signatures. In fact, we subsequently wrote a paper where we identified a whole bunch of signature sequences and proposed them being interesting. But, but he, he really didn't trust the tree, right? Be and, and because the tree is a mathematical model of how evolution works, right? And it's not exactly the way things really occur because when you're right there, when you're making that divide between some group, right? It's population biology. Something bad happens. The entire desert, the desert is formed, the organism, this whole branch is wiped out and the other guys survive. And that shows up when you look a million years later at the tree. We I mean, never really trusted the tree per se. So I don't know, does that help or hurt? I mean, Carl, Carl a lot about stuff too, and I love signatures too. And I also love trees. Yeah. Carl's hard, I think he wouldn't say they just like the trees, that's the same thing. Yeah. I think it's funny about hard here. Yeah. It's the, the information that he had from his already catalog provided higher resolution, and, and thereby a closer look at particular things. Okay. Yeah, but he, he believed in those signatures because it was all about puzzle solving. He, he was solving puzzles. So each oligo, as you well know, because you did the same thing, each oligo was a puzzle, and he would have to solve that puzzle. And, when, and he solved that puzzle in Bacillus megatherium, and then when you look at Bacillus subtilis, all of a sudden the same puzzle comes up. And he has the same solution. And he sees it three times, five times, seven times. And all of a sudden, I said, I've seen this before. And he would come to me sometimes, because I was keeping the dictionary, right? I had the computerized dictionary and everything. And, and he would come to me and say, this sequence, I've seen it before, haven't I? What organism see this? And I'd have to look it up for him, right? But he loved those signatures. He, and that's where the signature idea came from. He, so maybe it's not right to say he didn't like trees, but he certainly loved those signatures.
Absolutely true. Absolutely true. The problem was he didn't know what they were in many cases. He didn't know what the modification was. But we, I still have that information, in fact. I have all the original IBM cards, and I've been trying to, I may actually get them translated into a file and try to store it somewhere. But yeah, for every one of the organisms that looked at, the, we, he knew where the modifications were and that they were universal. And of course, the Archie had an entirely different set of modifications, which was one of the first things that led to the proposal of the Third Kingdom. Okay. Uh, they're very conserved because those secondary structures are very conserved. Now we, we only have access to ribosomes from a few, you know, 3D structures from a few ribosomes of thermos and dinococcus and halophile and E. coli. Uh, so, so, but based on, based on those, to the extent we have data, because we're looking at, for example, before and after, so EFG, which is involved in the process, uh, you know, EFG carries a GTP and that's cleaved, and so you're looking at the structure before it's cleaved and after it's cleaved to see what motions occur, and you can't do that unless you have such structures, so we can't just look at random organisms. If, if what? If the motions that are dictated by those control points, are they sequential? Do they happen in sequence or are they considered unique? Uh, I can't seriously answer that question, but our belief would be that there's some kind of sequence of motions that when you make the peptide bond, when you make the peptide bond, it's time for the tRNA to move. So there has to be a sequence of motions, a sequence of information that goes over to the decoding site and basically causes it to then change conformation and then go back the other way. So there has to be kind of a two-way path of the motion so that the tRNA moves and then the peptide bond is formed and then the tRNA moves again and et cetera, et cetera. So there has to be coordination of all the motion, which is what this primitive network slide is trying to say. But, you know, we have really don't have that worked out. And I think for the ribosome people, people who are interested in how it works, uh, as opposed to where it came from, that's a really big issue for them. And I think they, they're going to make progress on that, with confidence. Okay, so why don't we thank George one more time. Mm -hmm.